Uh, good evening. How Welcome to the annual Baltimore City Board of Estimates Taxpayers Night. Uh, thank you all for joining us this evening for our first ever virtual uh, Baltimore City Board of Estimates Taxpayers Night. I want to thank uh, my staff and the budget office for planning this event, a great way for us to communicate with our citizens amidst this COVID-19 crisis. Uh, we hope that everyone is uh, still taking this crisis very seriously, practicing social distancing and remaining as safe as possible as we, as we deal with this uh, public health pandemic. Taxpayers Night is an event to provide the public with an opportunity to comment on the preliminary budget for fiscal 2021 that was recommended to the Board of Estimates by the Department of Finance on April the 1st, 2020. Amid this coronavirus health emergency, budget season presses on. I am thankful we still have the opportunity, uh, we still have the, the opportunity to engage with our residents and hear your concerns. In the interest of promoting the order and efficiency of these of this public and virtual meeting, persons who have disrupted and do not oblige courteous rules will be asked to leave the meeting and may be uh, subject to ejection out of the call. So thank you for that. Uh, this year we'll be doing things a little differently. Historically, the Bureau of Budget Management Research presents to the board and to the agencies before Taxpayers Night in a separate event. This year we'll combine both of those events and BBMER uh, BBMR will present here, and then we will open the floor uh, to the public to hear your input. At this time, I would like to introduce to you uh, the members of the Board of Estimates. I am again in Council President Brandon Scott. We are also joined by uh, Mayor Bernard C. Jack Young, Comptroller Joan Pratt, Solicitor Dana Moore, and DPW Director uh, Matt Garbar. We also have Mr. Bob Sinemi, uh, Director of the Bureau of Budget and Management Research. I will now turn it over to Bob to present uh, this year's budget and what we know so far about the fiscal impacts of COVID-19 on the city's fiscal uh, situation. Bob? Bob, you, you, you're hey. muted if you're yep, speaking. Bob. Can you guys hear me? Yep, we can hear you, Bob. Thank All you. All right. Th thank you, Mr. President. And uh, thank you, members of the board, Mr. Mayor, Madam Comptroller. Uh, uh, it's a pleasure to be here tonight and present on the fiscal 2021 budget plan. Uh, as the president mentioned, we do have a, a bit of a different approach this year. Um, in a normal year, we would be getting together in public, of course, usually at the War Memorial Building to go over the, the plan for fiscal 21. Uh, tonight, we'll have a virtual approach to the, to the agenda. And uh, because of the circumstances of the COVID-19 pandemic, we're, we're going to present on both the, the impact to the city on the fiscal 2020 budget and also where we are in the 2020 uh, budget process. So uh, I wanted to walk everybody through that uh, quickly so we can get on to public testimony. So first things first, um, again, just on the agenda, we'll talk a little bit about the COVID-19 pandemic, what that means for the city. And then we'll talk in detail, a little bit more detail about what that means for us in fiscal 2020 and fiscal 2021. Uh, so first, um, just about the pandemic and what it means for the city's financial situation. Uh, we've been watching this situation carefully since, uh, since back in January. Uh, and as the, the, the pandemic started to increase in severity, it was really in mid-March that we became aware, fully aware of the severe financial implications that that's, this, this would have for the city. Um, we are currently in fiscal 2020. We were also uh, planning for fiscal 2021. And because of this emergency, uh, it's really required us to rework um, all of the assumptions that we've had for both fiscal 2020 and fiscal 21. Uh, so first I wanted to to, to walk folks through what this means for fiscal 2020. And again, fiscal 2020 is the year, that's the budget year we're in. Uh, it started last July 1st, it ends this June 30th in 2020. So what we're seeing so far is that uh, many of the city's uh, revenue streams are, are, are being affected uh, significantly and negative, negatively. Um, our, most of our, many of our revenue streams are directly tied to just normal uh, daily acti economic activity, things like uh, businesses operating, you know, tourism and travel, and just all the daily activities, driving and parking and just doing things in the city. Because of the virus, all of those things have been either closed or, or discouraged, or they've slowed really to a crawl. 
And because of that, we have um, four uh, categories of revenues that have been severely impacted. They are transportation related revenues, uh, what we would call visitor and tourism related revenues, uh, income tax and investment earnings. And I wanna talk about each of those in a little bit more detail. Um, so first overall, in terms of what the, where those revenue streams fall in terms of the entire budget, on this slide here, um, we think that our property tax will not be significantly impacted. So that's the good news. So you can see that big blue chunk on the left of the graph, uh, we don't think will have a significant impact. Also the, the lighter blue uh, uh, portion of the pie, which is another 12.1% of the budget, uh, are a variety of other revenue sources that we don't think will be directly in, impacted by, the, by this pandemic. But everything else in the lighter colors, the kind of the light yellow, the green, and the brown, uh, which makes up nearly 33%, about a third of the city's revenue sources, we think will be severely impacted in some way. And for fiscal 20, the impact of that overall is 68.7 million below what we had been projecting before the pandemic. And I'll talk a little bit about more of the, about each of those. Um, so first, uh, transportation related revenues. Um, we have fewer people driving on our roads, fewer people parking. And what that means is that we're receiving fewer receipts and things like um, parking garage income, uh, parking taxes, uh, parking meter revenues, uh, parking fines, and we're issuing fewer traffic camera violations. Again, that's all related to people that are, you know, are, are at home mostly, are, are mostly uh, not able to travel. And so we're seeing much fewer, fewer revenues in those sources. We're also seeing a decline in what we call highway user revenues. That's a state revenue source uh, that is also dependent on transportation related activity. It includes things like gas taxes and vehicle registration, uh, titling fees, and that's a source at the state that gets shared with local jurisdictions. But as they've seen uh, more generic uh, decrease in activity, we're seeing fewer receipts there. Um, the next category is what I would call visitor or tourism related revenues. So uh, the three key ones are hotel tax. Um, at this point, we have very little occupancy at our city hotels, so we're not collecting uh, nearly as much hotel tax as we usually would for this type time of the year. Uh, can, as you know, the convention center um, is being prepped as a as kind of a backup uh, a hospital for the city. And until this emergency passes, there will be no events there. And we do collect revenue from the events that schedule uh, time in the convention center. So we will not receive anything through the rest of the fiscal year, we believe. Um, also, admissions and amusement tax. There is a tax on ticketed events in the city. Um, that, that includes things like concerts and sporting events. And again, since most of those events have been canceled, we think that those revenues will be way down uh, through the end of fiscal 2020. I should say that not only does this affect our, our, our travel and tourism revenues, uh, it hits us particularly hard because the springtime is when that activity starts to pick up. Uh, as baseball season starts up and more people are coming downtown, uh, those, those, those revenues are seasonal and they tend to peak in the spring and the summer months. So this does hit us at a particularly hard time of the year. Um, the other, the other items that will be affected are income tax. Um, income tax is dependent upon people, of course, working and earning wages. And you know, what we've seen recently, unfortunately, is we have record high numbers of applications for unemployment insurance. So um, we know that we'll be affected through the rest of this quarter and potentially into next fiscal year on income tax. And then uh, finally, the last big category is investment earnings. So the city, um, does invest its own cash balances into short-term investments, short-term securities, things like money market funds and treasury bills. Those are very low risk uh, securities. It gets us a little bit of interest on the cash balance we have. Um, but because the Federal Reserve has taken actions to try to lower interest rates, the, the offset, the, the, um, the, that has led to the city seeing uh, less interest income on its cash balances. Um, on the expenditure side of the budget, so we, we talked first about revenues. Um, on the expenditure side of the picture, things are a little bit more mixed. Um, on the one hand, we have a significant amount of additional emergency expenses. Uh, those are things, and that's on the left side of your screen now. Uh, those are things like we're uh, providing premium pay for critical staff. Um, we've purchased personal protective gear and cleaning supplies for our frontline employees. 
We've done some public health advertising to help spread the message of what citizens should be doing now. And then there's just general emergency planning to, to uh, cost to have our emergency operations center activated at this time. So we do expect more cost on that side. On the other hand, there are some non-essential expenses that we'll, we will see uh, fewer expenditures. Um, first, uh, right away, because of the revenue decline, um, we decided to institute uh, a non-essential hiring and spending freeze. That basically just means that for city agencies, if the person is not absolutely critical to delivering the frontline services, um, we're deferring any hires there. We're trying to limit spending there. And several ser city services, as you know, at this point are operating on a modified or even a suspended schedule at this point. So there's fewer costs in some of those services for things like overtime, uh, materials, supplies, and fuel, and vehicle maintenance, and things of that sort. Um, so we think that the overall impact on the expenditure side will be mixed, or at least it has been so far. Um, putting those pieces together, um, we had, at the end of the second quarter of fiscal 2020, which was before the pandemic, a hit, we were projecting to end fiscal 20 with a $26.4 million surplus overall in the general fund. Um, because of the sharp decline in revenues that we expect through the end of the, the fiscal year, the $68.7 million decline, uh, the net of that is that we will, we're will we projecting to end the year um, in a deficit position to the tune of $42.3 million. Uh, that assumes that the, the, the restrictions that are in place now will last through the uh, roughly the end of the fiscal year. And again, that's uncertain at this point. We don't know when uh, this will end. Um, what does that mean for the city overall? How do we how do we rectify that? Well, the city does keep um, a rainy day fund and the rainy day fund is uh, allowed to be used only as a last resort to balance the city's general fund budget. So uh, the policy says that after we've taken all reasonable actions at the end of the year if we still can't rectify the general fund and bring it to balance uh, that we can dip into the fund to balance the budget uh, the withdrawal any withdrawals that we do ultimately make from the fund have to be replenished by the city within five years uh, so we like to keep that as a as a last resort if possible um, there's also a variety of government aid packages uh, that are out there. A lot of the aid is going to uh, either directly to individuals or or to businesses or nonprofits. Uh, I would just call your attention to the second bullet from the bottom. Uh, part of the federal stimulus package was to provide uh, some money uh, to the state of Maryland, to each of the states that have been affected. So each state in the in the in the country is getting something. The estimates that we've seen so far is that. Uh, Baltimore will get somewhere in the neighborhood of $100 million uh, of federal stimulus money directly. And again, a lot of that will be used to make the city whole for the things we just talked about in fiscal 20, where we've had additional emergency expenses and just a rapid decline uh, in revenue. So that's the picture for fiscal 20. And then moving on to fiscal 21, uh, fiscal 21 is the year that would begin on July 1st of 2020. It would end uh, in June, on June 30th of next year. Um, just first a reminder about the budget process. Our, our budget process is an around the year uh, cycle. We actually start the work on the fiscal 2021 budget. Uh, we started last August. We build a baseline budget um, and we build in things like inflation and cost of living adjustments for employees and other costs in each of the city, in city agency budgets. In November, uh, roughly from November to January, agencies submit budget proposals for the next year, and then finance reviews those uh, those requests with the mayor uh, and his senior team. And then once the decisions have been made on the budget, uh, our department writes the preliminary budget plan, the one that was posted last uh, last Wednesday. And then from there, we work on on moving the budget through the through the steps to passage. So, uh, first, we present it to the Board of Estimates. Uh, in May, we'll present the final budget uh, recommendation to the Board of Estimates. Uh, and then from there, the City Council uh, holds holds hearings and then votes on the budget in June. So this year is, is unique in that um, the preliminary budget plan that we have released is, is uh, unfortunately almost outdated the minute it hit the, it hit the press. Um, the reason for that is that as the pandemic was growing in severity, uh, in mid-March, we our staff was already in the in the process of putting the finishing touches on the preliminary budget plan. So at that point, most of the decisions had been made. All the decisions had been made internally, 
um, and we were we were getting ready to present the budget for public input. Due to the speed at which this crisis escalated, we did not have the time to make significant revisions to the to the preliminary budget, and we chose um, to release the budget as is. And the reason we 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 did that. Uh, the reason we did that is for for three reasons. Um, one is that by law, the the charter requires us to release the plan for the budget in early April, and that keeps us on track uh, for the eventual budget passage that must happen by the end of the fiscal year. Um, the second point is because of this event uh, itself tonight. Uh, the preliminary budget plan serves as a reference point for public comment. So even though we're trying to downplay the preliminary budget because so much will have to change before a final budget is decided on. We wanted it to at least be a point of reference for, for public comment. And also, um, just to ensure full transparency, we felt it was important to get everything out to the public and really serve as a marker for what our plan was, our fiscal plan for the city, uh, before any pandemic revisions have to be made. Um, unfortunately, we believe that the revisions that will have to be made for the for the final budget that is due to the board back to the board on May the 6th, that they will be significant. Um, the questions that we have asked ourselves internally when trying to model uh, the, the our, our, our revenue projection for next year is, is really we've asked ourselves two questions. One, you know, how long will these containment uh, strict containment measures last. Um, you know, we're we're glad that they're in place because they're very important from a public health standpoint. Uh, unfortunately, the side effect is that we're losing a lot of revenue. And also, what will the economy look like once these measures are lifted? So, uh, we're trying to figure out what those scenarios will look like. Um, we have we have landed on a scenario in which we believe that the containment measures will be lifted sometime in the first quarter of fiscal 2021. That would be this summer and that the economy starts to slowly recover from a lower baseline. I should say this is not based on, um, you know, this projection we're making is just for forecasting purposes. Of course, a lot of the models on the public health side have shown various times when, the, when, the, when this emergency will peak and when it will start to fade. But for us to be safe, we've, we've assumed that um, uh, the containment measures will be lifted sometime in the summer and the economy will start to recover. But even when we look at that scenario, um, our revenue forecast would be down uh, over a hundred million dollars versus what was assumed in the in the preliminary budget that was posted last Wednesday. Um, that would put our numbers back to even pre-fiscal 19 uh, levels in terms of revenue. So, you know, it will require uh, difficult choices from us. Um, you know, all options will remain on the table. We've been meeting internally to decide um, how to proceed. Luckily for us, we did do some pre-planning work. Um, the mayor had decided in the fall that he wanted to have agencies at least plan around a potential 5% reduction scenario. And the purpose of that was planning for next fiscal year in fiscal 2022, when we expected some new educational cost increases to come into effect for the city. So luckily we had done a lot of the planning work with the agencies and we have an idea um, going forward of what, of what some of those options could be. Um, and next steps, for us, are we're working again with the mayor uh, and his team and city agencies to develop a, a revised budget that will address these revenue reductions. We'll be coming back to the Board of Estimates on May the 6th. Um, that's in order for us to meet the charter mandated budget timeline to have the, the, the board act on the budget be before it gets introduced in City Council. And at that time, we will promise to, of course, develop uh, materials similar to the preliminary budget book that was put out that tries to really clearly explain um, everything that's in the final budget and every decision that we have made to get to balance for fiscal 20, 2021. Um, so with that, I'd be happy to turn it over to uh, board members if they have any questions about uh, the process from here on out. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Bob. I, I will start first before going to other members of the board. Uh, Bob, thank you for your great work. And as, as always, thank you for looking out for the city, the citizens of Baltimore and the fiscal health of a great city. We know that uh, you and your office have saved the city from, from uh, lots of things over the years. So I want to first say thank you for being a, a great public servant. Bob, in, in comparison to, uh, you and I have talked about this uh, a bunch, in comparison to uh, the recession in, in 2008 and other things that we've saw, so other fiscal situations the city has been been through since you have been uh, working in the finance department and BBNBR. 
how does this compare? Where, where do you think that this COVID crisis, how does it compare to that? That's a good question. So um, I, I would say it's, it's at least as bad or even worse than the prior, uh, the, the recession that we last faced, which was, like you said, sometime in the, you know, 2009 into 2010 and 11. And the reason so far it, it looks like it's worse, at least to start, is that you know, we've never had a situation where whole segments of the economy have just been shut off all at once. So in the prior recession, um, you know, what happened was there was some there was some noise in the in the stock market and there was a lot of noise in the real estate market. And so that caused disruptions there. Uh, but the declines in the other revenue sources were related to that. Here um, we've had, you know, really through the rest of this fiscal year, we expect that whole segments of the economy, those things like hotel tax, convention center business, parking related revenues, uh, will are not just declining, but we, we expect to, to collect very little, if anything, in those sources completely. Um, so I think the difference so far, at least, is that we've had like a very abrupt stop to a certain segment of the economy. And then going forward, how we'll react to this, it's still a little bit unknown. You know, we're hoping that it's just a dip and that we'll slowly start to recover when the restrictions are lifted. But it's very uncertain at this point, And it really depends on how quickly we can uh, you know, put the public health risk to bed and get back to normal. So I would say to start, so far it's been worse. Um, how it will be in the long run and how it will affect us going forward is yet to be seen. Thank you. Just And just two more quick questions for you. Talk, talking about, uh, thinking about the things that we had to put in place with that 10 year fiscal plan. Uh, mm -hmm. do, you, do you think that the work that was done there has put us into a better place, even though we're in a bad spot now? How would we have would we be today fiscally had we not made those tough choices in the past? Yeah, so I, I think, you know, we, we made a couple of changes. Um, some of them go back almost a decade now that really set us up for, I, I would say, um, uh, uh, not necessarily success totally, but, but left us in a much better financial position. Uh, some of those things were uh, we reformed our health benefits uh, going back to 2013. That was a change that um, you know, got our costs under control on that side. It did ask our employees to contribute a little bit more for their benefits, but it contained the city's costs. Uh, and then we also reformed both the ERS um, civilian pension system and the F&P pension system. And again, some of those changes, you know, had some effects on employees in those systems, but they saved the city um, hundreds of millions of dollars over that time and put us on a better, a better footing. Um, last year, we had started to uh, refresh the 10 year financial plan. So what we did was we paused and we were we, the finance, the 10 year financial plan was implemented in 2013. And so in 2019, about halfway through that period, we paused and we actually have a new contract now to refresh the plan. And I can tell you for sure, um, just from the last couple of weeks, a lot of that work that was done, including the pre planning work I was speaking about with the agencies that happened over the course of the fall, and the work that we've been doing on the 10 year plan refresh has been really helpful as we've looked at options to balance fiscal 21. So I feel like we're in a much better position where we at least have the options. It's just a matter of sorting through them and choosing, you know, which ones will have the least impact on citizens and employees. And then my last thing, Bob, can you just talk a little bit about how your office works with the agencies and works with the mayor as you uh, are developing the budget? Uh, as it has, it has to make sure that the services that the citizens of Baltimore depend on, the things that they want to see expanded, like the city's commitment to education, uh, recreation and parks. Talk about how you guys go through working those things out, especially in a tough uh, fiscal situation like we are now. Sure. So um, it, generally in the summer or fall, when we start the planning process, our first step, of course, is to sit down with the mayor uh, and his team and just understand what what his priorities are for the city so that we can we can send agencies off on the right path and then from there um you know knowing what the general order of priorities is and, and for this mayor it's been he's been pretty clear to us about you know his interest in education his interest in kids uh, of course public safety is is has been a constant pressure for the city so our focus has been really on those areas uh and cleanliness as well so when we when we get the marching orders from the from this mayor and senior team and understand where his priorities lie, we reach out to the agencies and we ask them to submit budget proposals uh, for their agencies to tell us how their services best fit into that plan. And a lot of the work that we did in the fall 
was was discussing with agencies which which services are really really important to the to the citizens and make the biggest impact and which are the ones that you know even if they are you know serve some citizens in some way which ones do we think have the least impact and which ones could we scale back if we had to uh in the time of a fiscal issue like we have now we would never seek to to pull things back that serve residents but we always want to understand uh, for each agency, which ones are most important, which ones are 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 less important to citizens, so that we have options at our disposal. Uh, again, that we have a fiscal issue like we have now going into twenty one, that we make decisions uh, that that have the the least amount of impact that's possible for our citizens. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor, uh, Madam Comptroller. Any questions from you, uh, Madam Solicitor, Mr. Director? Um, this is, um, if I might be recognized. Yes, uh, Madam Solicitor. Uh, thank you. Uh, I had a question for Mr. Sename. We He talked about the uh, yes. stimulus money that would come to the state of Maryland and then down to Baltimore. Uh, do we have any uh, those funds might become available to the city? So we, we, we are not sure yet when they will become available. Um, what we know at this point, we've been working very closely with the, the mayor's office of government relations and our state and our federal partners to to understand all the sources that are that are available. What we know about the federal stimulus and that stabilization fund that I referred to is that the way the law is written is that it says that you can use the money for any expenses that you incur during the emergency that are <laughs> beyond what was it, what was expected in your most recently enacted budget. So for us, the most recently enacted budget is the year we're in for fiscal 2020. So we believe that we will be able to eventually get reimbursed for some of the emergency expenses we are incurring right now. Um, where we're less sure is whether we can backfill uh, some of the revenue holes that we've lost in fiscal 20 and fiscal 21. Uh, the law, as it's written, does not allow you to use it to just backfill general fund revenue. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we have been working with other mayors across the country you know, to sign on to 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 urge the federal government to allow us to use that money as flexibly as we can, because the the, the key issue for us is not just the emergency expenses, it's the serious declines in revenue that we've seen. Uh, so uh, it's still early. I mean, this that bill was only passed, I think, what, two weeks ago. Um, so there's a lot of energy in, in City Hall right now to work and try to figure out exactly how that can be used. But we don't know when it will come to us. But we just know what what is authorized per the law. Hey, um, um, Mr. President, um, I have a question for Bob. Yep. Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Hey, uh, uh, Bob. Um, first of all, thank you for um, the great work you and your team are doing. But thank my you. question is, if and when we have to use the rainy day fund, what impact would that have on the credit rating for the city of Baltimore in terms of borrowing? Yeah, so it's a, it's a good question. So um, one of the reasons that we have such a strong uh, credit rating, and and Baltimore is rated as a double A city, um, and, and the reason we have a strong credit rating is because we do have reserves available for 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 times of, of financial crisis like this. Um, our our goal in a, in any crisis like this is to only use the rainy day fund as a last resort. Um, if we do use it. Um, not as a, a last resort, there is the risk that um, the rating agency might look negatively upon that. Um, and and so, you know, we, de we definitely take that, that kind of action very seriously. The policy as it's written, uh, the rainy day fund policy says it can only be used to balance a general fund shortfall for the city after all reasonable expenses have been, have been maintained, have been, have been, have been met. Uh, or all reasonable um, actions have been taken to balance the budget. And so the, the policy is very stringent, but we think in a good way that ensures that it's available for a time of a true emergency like this. Hey, um, Bob, a follow-up question. Um, I would hope that in a pandemic um, like this, that the rating agency, because this is a crisis around the world, would not look at it in that sense so that we can uh, do what we need to do to uh, keep our city moving forward. So I would hope that um, our rating agency would look at this pandemic and um, not affect our borrowing power. Yeah, I, 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 not, I, but you know, I would hope that they would take that in consideration. I, yeah, I hope that they do, and we'll, we'll of course, uh, Mr. Mayor, be in touch with our 
uh, you, you know, Moody's and S&P, which are our main contacts to understand the implications. They've generally told us that they like the fact that we have a um, a, a strong reserve to, to and that it can be used in a time of emergency and also that they like um, the the fiscal policies that we have we're generally very conservative um, and they generally like to see that they know that we're not over aggressive and that we don't get we don't live beyond our means okay. so it's still a little early to know but I think they've generally been complimentary of, of um, you know the elected officials leadership and the financial policies that have been put in place over many years okay. Thank you. President. Madam Comptroller. Yes. Um, I'd like to thank Bob and the staff for their hard work in developing this budget. And we know that COVID-19 pandemic has disrupted the local economy and will lead to a loss in revenue as much as $100 million or more. Um, but I am pleased to hear that we may receive $100 million in stimulus from the state. We have some very difficult decisions to make as we work through this loss in revenue and still try to deliver vital services to the people of Baltimore. We are one city and I am confident that together we can overcome this challenge. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Madam, Madam Comptroller. Um, Director Garbark, you had a question? Yes, um, real quick, uh, Bob, there's been some discussion about another potential stimulus uh, bill coming from Washington. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk at all about that, or is that just sort of a rumor at this point, or, or is that something that may be coming to to also help assist us? Yeah, we we, we do think it, it's it's coming, although the details are are not very clear yet. Um, so again, we've been working with our federal you know state partners to make sure that um, our voice is heard. Uh, you know, if another bill comes about, my my um, my instinct from following this pretty closely is that the first stimulus bill. You know, I think for very good reason, focused on uh, directly on individuals and uh, folks that were struggling and folks that might be losing their job, and on businesses that were going to be facing hardships. Uh, there were, so there were provisions for local and state governments, but our instinct is in the next round there might be an opportunity for more help uh, for cities and states and, and local jurisdictions. But at this point, there's a lot of rumors and there's a lot of discussion, but it's it's just beginning to kind of form now. Thank you, Bob. Uh, Bob, and for everyone uh, watching and in virtual attendance, I also want to acknowledge the virtual presence of uh, Councilwoman Sneed, Councilwoman McCray, Councilman Burnett, Councilman Pinkett, Councilman Bullock, Councilman Stokes, and Council Vice President Middleton. Uh, also, with many of our city agency heads that are watching uh, the council meet this uh, board of SMS taxpayers night virtually. I uh, also, Bob, want to just follow up on the mayor's point about the rainy day fund very quickly and say uh, I, that I agree. I hope uh, that our folks that are looking at our bond rating and looking at how we have handled ourselves will understand that if there ever was a rainy day, uh, this is that moment, not just for Baltimore, but for the country and the world. And that folks have to understand that when you have uh, drastic times, you have to take drastic measures that we would never even think about doing before, even if that means uh, changing policy and moving forward. So hopefully uh, they're able to understand and we all can work together to make sure that the city can move forward and be healthy as we make it out of this. Uh, are there any other questions from the board members? Uh, Mr. President, I do have a question regarding the rainy day fund. Yep, Madam Solicitor. Yes, I see on social media, a lot of people saying, well, we need to pull from the rainy day fund for this item or that item. Um, you know, any array of things. And there are a lot of people I hope that are watching tonight because it's taxpayers night. Bob, uh, could you sort of walk through the kinds of things that the rainy day fund can be used for? Sure, so the the, the policy as written, um, and it is it is stringent uh, for, for a reason. The policy as written says it is, it is to be used only uh, to balance the general fund budget if the general fund ends in a deficit position after all reasonable uh, means have been taken to balance the budget. So what that means is that um, in, a, in a year like this, um, since we've had a decline in revenue, we're projecting a, a deficit through the end of fiscal 2020. And part of that deficit could be some of the emergency expenses uh, that we're incurring that were not anticipated. So what the policy says is as long as we've taken every reasonable means to uh, to hold off on not essential spending, 
uh, that we can use that fund at the end of the year in a situation like this. And this is this is the type of situation yeah. that was anticipated when you have a sharp drop off in revenues and you have additional unanticipated expenses. Just for perspective, the last uh, uh, this one of the last times this was used was in 2010 when we had both a similar decline in revenues like this, and we had. If you remember, uh, two significant snowstorms in the same year, uh, where we had significant costs. So um, that was one of the last times. That was one, one of the only times we've ever used the fund to balance the budget. So that's the that's the way the policy works. Thank you. Thank you very much. I have a question. Is it? Oh, I appreciate sorry. all of your work, Bob. Thank you, Madam Comptroller. Hold on one second. I got a follow up question for for the budget director, Bob. Uh, that policy is a board of estimates policy and can be changed by the board. Correct. That's that's correct. Thank you, Madam Comptroller. Yes, Bob. What is the balance in the rainy day fund? Uh, it's about one hundred and forty five million dollars. OK, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, board members. Uh, all right. Uh, now, as always, the members of the Board of Estimates are very interested in listening to your views and observations concerning this budget. Uh, as you are the most important portion of, of this meeting, this is our opportunity to hear from you, uh, Baltimoreans, directly. And this is your opportunity as city residents to share your thoughts regarding uh, city spending, budget priorities, and all other fiscal uh, fiscal concerns. Also, would like to acknowledge the president, the presence of Councilman Zeke Cohen, who is on, on on the WebEx as well. If you have signed up to speak already, you will be called on and unmuted by a moderator when it's your turn to speak. If you wish to sign up during this call, uh, go to bit.ly slash boe testimony. Again, that's bit.ly slash boe testimony as you can see on the screen now. Uh, since we are here to listen, we do not in to, to intend to enter into a dialogue with you as you speak, but may ask you to clarify at point at any time. We strongly urge you to find a quiet place uh, with a strong internet connection. Please identify yourself before you speak by stating your name. We will have you muted on our end, but to assure uh, no background noise, please mute yourself when you are not speaking and please speak slowly and clearly. Anyone willing to, uh, wishing to address the board that has not already submitted your testimony online can still do so until April the 10th, and please send it to budget at baltimorecity.gov, or uh, again, that's budget at baltimorecity.gov, or record a voicemail at 443-984-8910, 443-984-8910, we ask that you limit your remarks to two minutes so that everyone uh, can have a opportunity to speak. And now we will begin. I will call the first person in one second. All right. The first person uh, to speak is going to be Miss Katrina Odom. Miss Odom. All right, we're going to move on from Miss Odom. Uh, we are now going to go to Scott Richmond. Scott, are you there? All right, Scott, if you can hear us, unmute yourself. All right, uh, we are now going to. Uh, or you can raise your hand on, on the screen. You click the raise your hand button. Uh, we're going to try to uh, go back to Katrina Odom. Katrina, we're going to try you again. Nope. All right. We're going to move uh, to the third person, Colton Perry. Colton? Yes. Hello. Yep. Colton, the floor is yours. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. Um, my name is Carlton Perry, and I'm a lifelong resident of Baltimore City and of the Emerson Village community. And uh, thank you for the opportunity to uh, address the board. Uh, as we've talked about, this is a time of unprecedented um, 
uh, uh, unprecedented issues with COVID-19 and the economic downturn that we're currently facing. And I'm worried about my community. I'm worried that um, the issues will disproportionately affect the lives of vulnerable citizens in my community, especially the elderly and dis um, economically disadvantaged youth. Um, one issue that I'm worried about is that in the current budget proposal that there's a lot of focus on spending for things like law enforcement and such. And the current, some of the current issues that we are facing right now are issues that we can't simply police our way out of. What we need is we need a budget that's fairly allocated. We need a budget that addresses public health, economic resource disparities, and community-based law enforcement. We need something that's going to help people and citizens to try and um, remedy some of the losses and lost ground that we've, um, which you've talked, which you've touched on, some of the lost ground that we've um, lost due to the pandemic and economic downturn. So we can build, come stronger, become stronger as a city and as a community, and can grow forward from where we are currently. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Colton. And please, if you have, again, uh, further testimony, please be sure to email that in. Uh, the next person we're going to try is uh, Catherine Klossick. Catherine, are you there? The floor is yours. All right. Uh, we'll try to come back to Catherine. Uh, Melissa Schober. Melissa, are you there? I am. Can you hear me? Yep. The floor is yours, Melissa. How are you? I'm well, thank you. So good evening and uh, thank you for holding this virtually. I know that the preliminary FY21 numbers are in fact just that very preliminary and to be amended. However, in looking through the FY21 numbers, I noticed that in the Department of Health, there is a $755,000 cut to three lines of service, clinical services, substance abuse and mental health services, and a $271,000 cut to school health services. Of particular interest to me in these times, given our limited resources, is how we can best allocate those funds. Through a recent MPIA request, I discovered that both city school police and Baltimore police are executing literally hundreds of emergency petitions to transport children to emergency rooms for mental health disorders every year. Over the past three years, the Baltimore Police Department has transported uh, 1,310 times, and the city schools police has transported 280 times. Those are hours that men and women who are not trained in mental health services are transporting children and youth into a pipeline that sends them to juvenile services, to child welfare, and uh, to suspension and expulsion. These numbers are extremely alarming. And the cuts to mental health services that are reflected in the preliminary 21 budget are unjust and immoral. I want to know why Mayor Young would support a budget that would cut three quarters of a million dollars from the health functions of the city at the same time that the BPD admin and information technology department receives $594,000 more, the SWAT unit receives $570,000 more, the mounted unit receives $204,000 more and the marine unit $116,000 more. Are our children who are being transported because they are a danger to self or others less important? Because that's what your budget seems to reflect, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Melissa. Thank you. Next, we are going to go to Ruth uh, Schober Levine. Ruth, are you there? Can, can you hear me? Yes, Ruth. Yes, we can hear you. So I know my mom just said about the the school fund for nurses. I want to discuss we are going through a pandemic. And yet the mayor is cutting school health services, which not only includes services for physical health, but it also includes services for mental health, which can be very important during times, during times of distress. When there was news coming out of coronavirus, a bunch of kids were going to counseling because they were scared that 
that they were going to end up dying. So why are we cutting these vital services that we need for our children? Thank you. Thank you, Ruth. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, next is Stephanie Saxton. Stephanie, are you there? Stephanie, are you there? Can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you now. Floor is yours. Oh, great, thank you. Um, yeah, so as was said, the main part, the main revenue streams for the fiscal budget are really going to be hit. And one of the biggest parts of the revenue is property tax. Yet our, the biggest property owner in the city is still not paying property tax uh, per its pilot agreement. So I'm talking about Hopkins and other anchor institutions that are um, given the payment in lieu of taxes. Um, given the emergency, it seems pertinent to look into opening up the pilot agreement for the mayor and for those running for mayor at the moment. Um, and I'd like to echo what was said before that I'm concerned about an increase in the police budget at the moment, um, especially when we are short with education funding. And also, not only because, uh, like was said before, we can't police our way out of this moment, but the blueprint for Baltimore survey, which had a sample size of 5,000 Baltimoreans, showed that the majority of residents don't want increased spending on police, don't want increased police officers to handle public safety. In fact, the majority preferred other methods like uh, safe streets and uh, tackling mental health and drug abuse issues without police. So I wonder how our elected officials might explain an increase in the police budget, given that it's democratically not favorable. Um, thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you so much, Stephanie. Uh, next up, we have Stephen Merrick. Stephen. Stephen, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yep, we're good, Stephen. Oh, Floor's all yours, man. All right, great, great. Uh, greetings. My name is Stephen Merrick, and I will be presenting a Baltimore budget analysis on behalf of Communities Unite. Uh, this is the second year we've done an analysis of the budget, and yet again, we see that there are more funds being allocated to the Baltimore City Police Department than investments in Baltimore City communities. Proposed spending on the police and sheriff's departments is $535 million, which is up more than 20 million from the current year. Baltimore is spending so much more per capita than districts with similar urban challenges. It's about as high as any city we know of, and now you're just increasing it. Per capita spending would reach a high of $902 per resident, up from $817 in the current year. This greatly outsizes other cities. In fiscal year 2017, when Baltimore spent $772 per resident, Detroit spent $450, and New York spent $581, and Houston $383. There is also outsized spending on the police and sheriff's department compared to spending on substance use and mental health. 888 people died from drug and alcohol related deaths in Baltimore in 2018 compared to 309 homicides. Both of those figures were higher in 2019 with drug and alcohol related deaths well surpassing the 2018 record. I would also like to highlight that this budget spends more on police than it does providing the much needed resources that our kids need in order to ensure them the quality education they deserve. As you can see, more than twice as many people are dying of overdose than murder and yet the budget proposes spending a mere penny on substance abuse and mental health programs for every dollar spent on police for the second year since we've done this analysis. In the last 10 years combined, general, uh, general fund spending on the police department and sheriff's department has grown by 62.4% from 329.6 million in fiscal year 2011 to 553.3 million in fiscal year 2021. This growth outpaces the growth of the total general fund, which increased by 54% over the same time period. In 2019, Baltimore City spent nearly 50 million on police overtime, with 50 million 
We could drastically reduce the number of drug and alcohol related deaths in our city and provide funds for our schools. This budget needs to be seriously reevaluated and I urge you to do so. Uh, once again, my name is Steve American. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen to me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you. Uh, we're going to, again, I'm going to try uh, some of the folks who we, we couldn't find and ask them to raise their hand, uh, starting again at the stop, at the, at the top. Uh, Katrina Odom, Katrina, if you're there, please uh, raise your hand or, and, so that we can find you and unmute you. All right, uh, we're gonna try Scott Richmond. Scott, can you try to uh, hit the raise your hand function so that we can find you, so we can um, they can unmute you. Scott Richmond. All right, uh, Catherine Klossick. Catherine, can you hit the uh, raise hand raising function so that they can find you and unmute you? All right, Mark Matthews, we're going to try you again, Mark Matthews. Uh, Kawan Jackson, uh, Kawan, are you there? If, they, if you are there, please hit the raise your hand function so they can try to find you and unmute you. Kawan, are you still there? Good evening. Hey, good evening, Kawan, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, the, the, the floor is yours. Actually, this is Mark Matthews. Oh, hey. Oh, hey, Mr. Mark. How are you? Good brother. The floor is yours. I'm just fine. Thank you all. Thank uh, you. I'm very brief. Uh, I do not have a prepared testimony, but I did email a testimony earlier. My concern is that post pandemic, the citizens of Baltimore are going to be in dire straits, uh, putting demands upon the municipal services that have not been seen for decades. And there is an agency within city government that was formed 50 years ago to meet these types of demands, uh, which specifically is in moving people from a poverty position to a position of self-sufficiency. Uh, so my concern is that that agency, which is the Community Action Partnership, continue to receive funding and most likely it will be determined at some point, hopefully, that the agency may even need to be expanded. Uh, that agency has a 50-year history here in Baltimore, moving from something known as model cities to the mayor stations and now community action. Uh, it has trained people in employment and health care, welding, how people form businesses, uh, which included health care services, child care services and so forth. There are currently five centers within the city. At one point there were 18 so that citizens could have access to services that they will desperately need once we come out the other side of this pandemic. So I would just urge the uh, board to consider taking a look at the line items for the Community Action Partnership and uh, see what can be done to maintain, if not expand, that agency. Thank you all and be safe. Thank you. Uh, thank you. We will now go to uh, Gaso Goba. Are you there? Hello. Hey, hello, hello. Good evening. The floor is yours. Hi, fabulous. Yeah, thank you all for uh, making this taxpayers' night as accessible as possible for folks during this pandemic. And I hope folks are keeping safe uh, during this time. So my name is Gaso Gobo from Sex Workers Outreach Project here in Baltimore City. And I just wanna lift up all of the concerns that everyone else has raised about how this pandemic is going to impact uh, some Baltimoreans who are the most vulnerable. I am talking about people who are living with chronic health issues, people who are formerly incarcerated, incarcerated right now, are selling sex in the street, are using drugs in the street, are homeless, a wide variety of vulnerabilities that folks have in Baltimore City. And I am again pleading with the Board of Estimates and all of the folks who have the political currency to act in good faith to Baltimoreans who do not have uh, the political and social currency that y'all do, that people who have um, homes do, that people that own homes, right? What about homeless folks who don't pay property taxes, 
What about their needs? We are again, as many of my comrades have looked it up, many of my community members have looked it up, taking money away from vital services in Baltimore City that help the most impacted and vulnerable amongst us to increase funding for the Baltimore City Police Department, who we know that continues to assault black and brown and white poor working class folks here in Baltimore City. It is ridiculous. It is enough. We need to implement harm reduction, preventative measures instead of looking to policing, instead of looking to surveillance, instead of looking to incarceration. I am sure many of you have undergraduate degrees, master's degrees, even doctorates. You have an understanding of what happens when we do not fund critical services that people need. We have an understanding of what happens to individuals when their basic needs are not met. Housing, quality education, healthcare that doesn't discriminate against you, police officers who don't see you as less than human. Again, I am urging you to reconsider how you allocate these funds and stop, for the love of God, giving so much money to a police force who would rather see black and brown and poor white sex workers, people who are using drugs and people who are homeless in jail to line their pockets. Thank you very much. And thank you for allowing me this opportunity to speak for my community and folks that I love. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, we're going to go uh, one more time, try to see if these folks are still on the line. Katrina Odom. Katrina, are you there? Scott Richmond. Scott, are you there? Catherine Klossick. Catherine, are you there? All right. Uh, Kawan Jackson. Kawan, are you there? And A. Thompson, are you there? All right. Thank you. Uh, that was the last person signed up to speak this evening. I want to thank everyone for participating in the first uh, virtual Board of Ex uh, Estimates Taxpayers Night. Your comments have been heard and duly noted. Uh, all the members of the board appreciate you taking the time to share your thoughts on uh, the mayor's proposed budget. Next up for the budget process are as follows. Uh, the Bureau of Budget and Management Research will present the proposed ordinance and estimates for fiscal 2021 to the Board of Estimates with any am amendments or adjustments as needed. As we know, there will be some uh, per budget director sent to me today. The proposed ordinance of estimates will be sent uh, then to the City Council for deliberation. Uh, we, we also know uh, that Beginning in May, the City Council will hold hearings with city agencies on the proposed budget, uh, the cuts and revenue proposal. I want to take a moment to also recognize, I see that Councilman Henry has joined us on the WebEx as well. So in May, the Council will deliberate the, the, the budget proposals that we know are going to be sent to us, going to be significantly different than the one we have today. They're taking time uh, for the City Council's Taxpayers Night and a specific list of hearing dates and times will be announced at an upcoming City Council meeting and posted on the City Council website at BaltimoreCityCouncil.com. Uh, we know that's going to again be there for everyone to see at BaltimoreCityCouncil.com uh, so that we can make sure that you all have this. At this time, I would like to, to ask any of the members of the board if they have any questions or comments before I close. All right. Uh, thank you. Thank you all. Again, thank you for participating tonight in tonight's meeting. Again, this budget is very, very much in flux. We know revenue will be down. We are going to have to make tough decisions to move forward. And although we know this and we must respond uh, to the fact that we know this, our residents are hurting, we are going to make sure that we are reaching out. As long as there is breath in my body, I'm going to make sure that Baltimore City is operating uh, in everything in my power to understand this uh, virus and this pandemic that we're going through and the ongoing gun violence epidemic and the ongoing overdose epidemic that we have in Baltimore City. We are going to look out for those who are 
experiencing homelessness, who are returning from prison, who are currently incarcerated, those who are living with pre-existing health conditions, small businesses, people who need access to food, and most importantly, our young people. It may seem like a daunting task, and we know that this is daunting, but again, we are Baltimore. We cannot be broken. We will make it through this together as long as we are adhering to the advice of public health professionals in every single thing that we do, working with each other, doing what we do best in a crisis here in Baltimore. And that's coming together to show the world that we are a city unlike any other with a resolve and a deep desire to come together and show everyone that when they think that we're down and out, that Baltimore always comes back. So keep your spirits up, Baltimore. Keep your heads high. Be sure to stay in tune with your city government as we're providing updates throughout this crisis, and we will make sure that we continuously communicate with you. Thank you and have a good evening.